for that introduction. And thank you for, oh, excuse me. Thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I'm really happy to be talking to all of you. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you have interest in water temperature and the future of our cold water fish. So I wanted to start off with a little bit of an introduction. So I'm, I'm a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service Gulf of, Maine, Gulf of Maine Coastal Program. We're located in Falmouth, Maine, but we work all over the state. And as you can see on our mission statement on the slide, we really, we work through partnerships. Everything that we do is based on voluntary partnerships. Um, we work with private landowners, with tribes, and with state, municipal, federal, academic, and non-governmental organizations to restore fish passage monitor habitat and enhance fish habitat in Maine streams. Two of our regional priorities include connecting people to nature and strategic conservation across landscapes. These are both relevant to some of the water temperature monitoring efforts that I'll talk about in later slides. But um, Riley, if you could pull up the poll, I really have a hard time doing this without getting to see my audience. And so I did prepare a couple of interactive polls. Um, they're very simple. They just would like to learn a little bit more about you and what brought you to the talk today. So if we could just take a minute or two to answer that, that would be lovely. And I'm also interested to see if any of you are recreational fishermen. Great, that's about half. Give it a few more minutes. Looks to be equal amount of interest in freshwater rivers, tidal streams and estuaries, and interest in Maine's fish populations. So that's great. And it's about half and half people who fish and people who don't. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, here are the poll results. Um, most of you are interested in freshwater rivers, streams and estuaries, and means fish populations. That's great. Um, and I did have that question about fishing re recreationally because I am not a fisherman myself um, and I really have a habitat, habitat focus in this office. So I have some general knowledge about cold water fish populations and I'll discuss a little bit about those fish today, um, but my real expertise is in water temperature. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer any more specific questions that you do have about those populations, but I certainly certainly don't consider myself an expert of East Coast fish. Before I launch into the presentation, I wanted to take a minute to define some of the terms so that we're all on the same page. I'll use a, these terms a lot throughout the presentation. So first, a watershed or drainage area or catchment. I might use these terms interchangeably. And it defines an area of land that drains all of the streams and rainfall within an area to a common outlet, like a reservoir outlet, a stream, or the mouth of a bay. Um, watershed is really just a big drainage area. I'll also use the term HUC, which stands for hydrologic unit code. So a, this is a unique numeric code that's assigned to every watershed in the US. And a bigger HUC number means a smaller drainage area. So this is a map of all the HUC-6 drainage areas across the Northeast. At a HUC-8, we have even smaller drainage areas. And at a HUC-12, they become very small. And we even have smaller drainage catchment bases within these HUCs. And so I'll be showing some of these slides later today. And I just want to make sure we all understand that these all define watersheds and drainage areas. Finally, I'll use the term diadromous quite a, quite a bit, and that's a term for fish that move between freshwater and the ocean. And I'll particularly be using this to talk about Atlantic salmon um, and rainbow smelt. So why is water temperature important? It's a primary control on the type, number, and variety of living things within an aquatic habitat. 
This really is particularly relevant in Maine because we have a lot of cold water fish populations that are culturally significant to a lot of people here. We're the only state in the contiguous US that has native populations of Arctic char and wild sea run Atlantic salmon. They're both cold water fish species. Maine is also considered the last stronghold for wild self-sustaining populations of Eastern brook trout in their native range. Water temperature has a major influence on biological activity and growth of aquatic species, and it affects the survival of these species. Water temperature is a major cue for spawning, migration, and dispersal patterns um, for many fish species, especially those that migrate from coastal to freshwater habitats to spawn. It affects predator-prey overlap, both directly and indirectly. A lot of predatory warm water game fish do not naturally occur in the same habitats as cold water species. And also the migratory spawning patterns governed by water temperature changes for large numbers of fish could act as a predator shield for other diadromous fish species. And finally, water temperature has an effect on water chemistry and it influences water quality. In general, colder water has higher dissolved oxygen and higher water quality than warm water. The climate in Maine is changing. We're experiencing longer summers and shorter winters by about two weeks on either end. The 60 degree day we had yesterday in February is just a great reminder of this. Some climate models predict that temperatures could increase anywhere between two to 10 degrees statewide within the next century. And because there is a relationship between air and water temperature, this means our stream temperatures will also increase. The ocean in the Gulf of Maine is also warming faster than almost any other region of the world. So this affects temperatures of coastal streams that are influenced by tidal exchange. Our cold water fish species have adapted to thrive in cold temperatures and they demonstrate a little bit of ability to acclimate to warmer temperatures, but the adaptive capacities of our cold water fish in the Northeast are largely unknown. So here are just a handful of Maine's iconic cold water fish species. On the left, brook trout and Atlantic salmon are two of fish that occur in freshwater streams across the state, although Atlantic salmon historically had a much wider geographic range. Atlantic salmon spend the first two years of their life in freshwater streams, then migrate out to the ocean and return as adults to spawn. And although I don't know too much about salter brook trout, um, there are there is some indication that there are some brook trout in, in coastal Maine who go out to the ocean as well. Rainbow smelt naturally occur in coastal Maine and in estuaries, although they've also been stocked in freshwater lakes where they didn't always occur naturally. And now those populations are self-sustaining. Arctic char and lake trout both occur only in lakes in Maine and are some of our more temperature sensitive species. Sorry, I should define that better. They, they occur in lakes. Um, they don't occur only in Maine. Um, all of these species thrive in cold water temperatures. And each one of these species starts to experience stress when water temperature goes above this top number pictured on the screen. So for brook trout and Atlantic salmon, when water temperatures go above 68 degrees Fahrenheit, they start to experience stress. That number is even lower for rainbow smelt, for Arctic char, and for lake trout. And when we start to see water temperatures at 70 degrees, 74 degrees, 75 degrees, um, and for Atlantic salmon, 80 degrees, it really starts to affect the survival of these species. And that's right around the threshold that these fish populations can survive. Now to contrast, here are some pictures of warm water fishes in Maine. I didn't even try to include lethal warm temperatures for these species because a lot of them can survive in very warm water. And these temperature measurements next to each fish are generally considered their optimal temperature range. All of these fish, except for largemouth bass, are native to Maine, but they have also been stocked all over the state in areas where they did not occur naturally. So there are many areas where, where they are, they have just prolifer pro proliferated. 
One thing that they all have in common is that they are all prolific predators. They have a high metabolic rate, which allows them to live in warm water. And this introduces an additional threat to cold water fish when water temperatures become warm enough for these species to overlap with some of our cold water fish. So when warm water fish are at these high temperatures, which are at or above the survival threshold for cold water fish, they're in their prime. Um, and it makes these cold water fish easier targets. This is a visualization of how water temperatures can affect the survival of an Atlantic salmon. These graphs measure, measure the water temperature in a salmon stream in the Sheepscot watershed, which is located in south central Maine. The vertical axis shows water temperature measurements in Celsius, and the horizontal axis shows time. So Atlantic salmon really prefer temperatures of 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, which is around 59 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the temperature changes a little bit depending on their life stage. But Atlantic salmon will actually stop feeding and travel six or more miles to escape sustained water temperatures that are at or above 71 degrees Fahrenheit for multiple days. So the, in, you can see that in the summer in this, in this salmon stream, temperatures actually exceeded that stress threshold for most of the summer. Um, once we reached July, it hovered above this, this threshold. And you can even see that some of the maximum daily temperatures exceeded the survival threshold. So even, even now we're starting to see our fish populations affected by these warmer temperatures. Finally, spawning migration is really driven by water temperature. I've picked four species here. I'll start with alewife and blueback herring. This is not a cold water fish, but the alewife and the, hair, and the blueback herring run is one of Maine's most iconic spawning runs. Um, if you've ever been to the Damariscotta fish ladder in the summertime, or even the fish ladder in Bath, um, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, but water temperature is really the prime, the prime driver of this migration. Alewife and herring will wait at the mouth of streams until the temperature reaches this optimal range, and then they will all migrate upstream to spawn. For Atlantic salmon, this migration occurs in the fall when water temperatures hover around 41 to 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And for rainbow smell, it occurs in the, in the spring. They start to move upstream to spawn around 37 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but the optimal range goes up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, historically, that means that these spawning runs have been confined to specific seasons and specific time periods. For alewife, the migration has begun in early May and gone through early June. Blueback herring runs start a little bit later. They start in late May and go into June. And Atlantic salmon has occurred in the fall, while rainbow smelt has occurred in the spring. So as stream temperatures change, we may start to see the timing of all these runs change. And there's, we don't really know how the spawning runs are going to be affected by climate change. And that's something that we're watching right now. So I've talked a lot about how water temperatures affect fish. So here are some characteristics that affect water temperature. First, the landscape, elevation, has a big effect on water temperature. In general, higher elevations mean colder water temperatures. We have smaller headwater streams. Land cover also has a large effect on water temperature. And that includes not just the riparian cover next to the stream, but the entire landscape, how forested it is, how developed it is, um, and whether or not there are agricultural activities occurring. The amount of sunlight or solar radiation on a river has a huge effect on water temperature. And so riparian buffers along the stream provide shade and really do have a big impact on water temperature. Outside climate factors like air temperature and precipitation also have an effect. Um, precipitation, especially in cities, um, can have a big increase in water temperature as rain gathers in streets um, and it doesn't have a chance to percolate into the soil when it enters a stream it, it can raise that temperature a couple of degrees. Groundwater input also has an effect. Springs remain cold all summer long and they remain they remain flowing in the winter time. 
the geology of a stream also has an impact. Um, it de depending on how porous the bedrock of a stream is, um, there may or may not be hyporic exchange, which is a mixing of the water and the sediment. Um, and so that has a big impact. Um, also soil type runoff, the number of impoundments and the number of barriers within a river have a big impact. Um, barriers such as culverts at road crossings um, or even larger impoundments and dams have a large warming effect on streams. And finally, the complexity of the watershed has an impact as well. In general, more complexity is better because we'll, have a, we'll see a variation in water temperatures. So what is US Fish and Wildlife Service doing to help cold water fish? As I mentioned, all of our projects are partnership based. Um, so we work with state and nonprofit organizations to enhance habitat in salmon and brook trout streams. Um, here in this picture, we're adding log structures to increase complexity, to, compl to give fish some cover, to provide some of that riparian shade to lower the water temperature. Um, and this also helps with mixing. We're restoring access to cold water streams, um, replacing undersized culverts at road crossings and allowing more passage to those areas where we have ground groundwater inputs and high riparian cover and much cooler temperatures. And finally, we're working with a variety of people across the state to monitor water temperature. And I'll spend the next few slides talking about that. Um, and the purpose of this monitoring study is to find vulnerable and resilient streams. Um, so streams that, that are likely to be inhospitable for cold water fish um, and, and others that will continue to host cold water fish as the air temperature warms. So the Mainstream Temperature Working Group is a collaborative between around 27 state, federal, tribal, educational, and non-governmental organizations that started in 2015. Um, we've been monitoring temperature with these little tidbit loggers that you see at the bottom of the screen. Um, this little orange sensor is actual size and these tiny little loggers are very rugged. They can be left out in a stream all year and they have enough memory to record water temperature for a half an hour or every half hour for up to two and a half years before they fill up. So. We have worked with all of these organizations that you see at the bottom and more um, to put these loggers out in streams all over the state. And all of these dots that you see on the left side of the screen are active monitoring locations. Um, all of our data gets uploaded to a shared online database, httpbb.ecosheds.org. Um, and so I'm hopefully going to connect to this database right now so that you can see how this works. Um, this is a really cool way to explore your watershed and see if you can find monitoring locations near you. Here we go. So here's the, the, the EcoSheds monitoring system. And as I said, all of these dots here are temperature monitoring locations across the state of Maine. And down here, we have a list of all the organizations that are monitoring temperature throughout the entire Northeast region. So if I want to zoom in to let's say Freeport, Maine, because we've gotten quite a bit of help from Trout Unlimited in this area, I can zoom and pan around this just like I'm using Google Maps. And I can click on one of these blue dots right here and then view the water temperature data that's been out at this station. So I can see a time series value here and a graph of all the temperature values here on the right. And I can look at the daily mean and range. I can compare it to the air temperature. And I can see if these are temperatures that would support brook trout. Um, for most of the, we had a little bit of a high period here in August, but for most of the season, these temperatures are generally low enough to support eastern brook trout. And I think one of the coolest things about this database is that some of this temperature data feeds into a temperature model that predicts stream temperature all across the state. Uh, this model was created by a research team at the USGS 
Silvio Oconte Anadromous Fish Lab. And I definitely want to credit um, Ben Letcher and Jeff Walker for contributing to these models. And so I'll just provide an overview of this tool right now. This is a pre recorded video, um, but if you have any questions about it, I'll answer that at the end. This is the interactive tool that all of this information feeds into. It's called the Interactive Catchment Explorer, or ICE for short. I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of this tool today, but you can come back to this website and check out the user guide, which will take you step by step through everything that you can do with this interactive tool. So I've already selected my watershed resolution from the drop down list up here. I've chosen to look at watersheds at the HOC 12 level and I've selected Maine as the state that I want to look into. Now I can choose from a variety of variables to explore my watersheds in this drop down list, but what I'm interested in is mean summer temperature, so I'm going to select that. Now I'm going to adjust the transparency of the top layer over here and change this base map to open street map because it's easier for me to navigate that way. And as I hover over each HUC 12, I can see the name of each huck as well as the predicted mean summer temperature. So I'm going to zoom in to Baxter State Park and let's select a watershed in this area. I'll select Trout Brook. When I click on this huck 12, then a little box comes up here that allows me to view the data for all of the variables within this huck 12. We can see that we have very high forest cover and very low mean summer temperatures. I can also view all of the small catchments and drainage areas within this HUC 12. And as I hover over each one, you can see the predicted mean summer temperature within each catchment. Now, if I want to use this data and overlay it with other data, then I can come right over here and download the, all of these catchments as a GeoJSON file. And this type of file can be used both with arc mapping software and with open source QGIS software. One final thing that I can do is to filter these catchments by another variable. So I'm going to come over to this drop down menu on the right and select forest cover. This allows me to view the drainage basins that have over 90% forest cover. And as you can see, because of Baxter State Park, as I'm selecting this filter, almost all of the catchments within this HUC 12 have over 90% forest cover. And that's probably one of the reasons why these water temperatures are so cold. So one of the variables that you can also choose to look at on the interactive catchment explorer is the probability of brook trout occupancy throughout Maine. Um, and you can look at the probability that brook trout re reside within that watershed today at current temperatures or under future climate scenarios. So it, yeah, if the, excuse me, uh, a yellow color means that there's a very high probability, almost 11% that brook trout can be in these watersheds, that these watersheds can support eastern brook trout. With an increase of plus two degrees, you see a lot more of these purple splotches, which are areas that are no longer warm enough to host brook trout. Um, and if you increase the air temperature by four degrees, almost the entire state of Maine becomes purple. You just have a like these yellower watersheds in these mountainous regions um, that might continue to support brook trout. Now, since the air temperature is projected to increase anywhere between two to 10 degrees over the next century, this is a huge concern. And so with this big monitoring project, we are hoping to find streams with groundwater so that we can prioritize these areas for protection and for restoration so that they can continue to host our cold water species as the temperature warms. There are things that you can do to help cold water fish as well. Um, even just simple things like planting buffers of native plants to reduce runoff. Um, even if you live in a city, if you live in a building that has a tiny backyard, any, any native plant with deep roots will help to reduce the amount of runoff that ends up in a stream. 
If you're lucky enough to live near a river, then plant or keep those riparian buffers. Um, if, you can if you can manage to not be able to look at the screen, the stream from a pretty picture window, it'll be a lot better for those water temperatures. And you can see in this picture here that even these tall grasses add some shade, which reduces water temperature. Finally, be engaged in your community. Um, look for land trusts like Kelt, look for nonprofit organizations. Um, check Google, check Facebook. Um, where I'm from, you check the local newspaper to see which organizations are active in the area, which organizations are focused on fisheries, um, and if there's anything you can do to support, to support your local streams. And finally, I have been working with Ruth at Kelt a little bit um, to identify new water temperature monitoring sites in the mid coast region. Um, we have a lot of volunteers signed up to help monitor already, but if you're really gung ho about wanting to monitor a stream near, near you, um, contact me or contact Ruth. And if you want to learn more about the water temperature working group um, and any of the associated web based tools that I showed, um, feel free to contact me anytime. That's all I've got. I know it's a little bit shorter than what I planned, but I tend to talk fast. So awesome. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, I think we've got a relatively small group tonight, about 15 folks. Are you comfortable if we um, just all look at faces? Absolutely. I just figure out, I have to figure out how to, I've lost all the faces on my screen. <laughs> Uh, or it, can you stop sharing? Yes. Okay, there you go. Oh, great. I'm so much more comfortable with looking at faces. So if everybody, um, if you click on the view in the top right hand corner that shows a gallery, you should be able to see everybody if you're interested. Um, and um, since it's a relatively small crew, if, if folks want to raise their hands and ask um, questions directly, please feel free to do that. So a couple questions came in on chat. And so maybe we'll start with those. Um, and if you're my power. interested in raising your hand, um, click on the, the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. Um, and it's in, in that you can find something that says raise your hand. If you also like, if you have your video on and you are waving, and raising your hand, we'll call on you that way too. Um, so I think, uh, let's see, a question had come in from Harriet. Harriet, do you wanna ask your question about temperatures? You would put one in the chat. Sure, the, uh, the graphs that you, or the chart you had uh, looked at data from 2017. So yeah. my question really was, so what's it look like now? And do you know that? Yeah, well, let me go to my screen. I'll try to go back to that exact same site. Um, I will say that the water temperature working group, we had a really big push to just like get equipment out there. And that's really been what the last four years have been about. Um, now that all the data is in, we're just starting to have the time to stop and take a breath and look at what we have and analyze what we have. So those, Temperature patterns um, are are yet to be are yet to be decoded, um, but I think it's I like to have at least a five year range of temperature because there are so many variables within a year that can affect um, that that can have a big impact. So it's a little bit tricky to um, tease out it, where when the water temperature is actually changing and it should be a matter of concern, or if if we had a bizarre drought year. Um, Jermaine, you had asked a question about the brook trout. Do you want to ask that? Oh, you're muted. Hi. Um, it was just recently you were talking about the huck, you know, and you had the huck map up, map up yep. and you're talking about brook trout in these various small areas. I don't think they were watersheds. And um, you just mentioned brook trout, and I was wondering are those because you said something early in your talk about I thought about them being native brook trout. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. These all these eastern brook trout are native to Maine. Absolutely. Yep. Um, there I've I've 
spent a few years working out west where eastern brook trout were an invasive species because <laughs> they had been stocked in lakes out there and they were really threatening um, species of native cutthroat trout. And so it's a little bit of a challenging thing to talk about too because I mean Maine really is the last stronghold for native wild self-sustaining populations. Yeah, because um, I come but, from upstate New York not too far away. Yeah. And there's a lot of problems with non-native Brook yep. trout being reintroduced into various lakes where they were not native, yep. you know. Yeah, yeah. Even here, even some of our like I I feel like I shouldn't say this too loud, but even like some of our lovely, wonderful native rainbow smelt that are in the estuaries and that come upstream to spawn, they've been put in lakes that they could never have gotten to um, naturally, even here in Maine. So there's been a lot of fish stocking um, and a lot of moving species around. Um, so, but the Eastern brook trout that I am talking about here in Maine are native fish that we're trying that to pretty cool. keep around. Yeah. yeah, it is pretty cool. Good, thank you. Yeah. It looks like Marika, you had a question about just using um, Celsius or Fahrenheit when talking about temperatures um, and, and what's preferred. Yeah, so I, I j we look at everything in Celsius and I tried to, convert everything to Fahrenheit for this presentation, just because I think that's just a little bit more familiar. But I did see a couple of graphs where I had failed um, and where the salmon temperature ranges were in Celsius. Um, so yes, so I always use Celsius, um, but I, in hopes of making it a little bit more accessible, hopefully I didn't make it a little more confusing. Um, but off the top of my head, those upper ranges for salmon, I think do translate to around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which is right around when we start to think that the water temperature starts getting warm. Okay, all right, well, thank you for the explanation. Yeah. And then Kat, did you wanna ask your question about um, fish tolerance in food? Kat, it looks like you unmuted, but I can't hear you. All right, I might read your question out, um, or if you wanna type into the chat, let me see. Um, so it, it looks like your question was how much, um, oh, camera's not working. All right, so how much of the fish tolerance of water temperature variations um, is reliant on their food sources and the effects of the temperature on those foods. What are these sources to food sources? That is a great question. Um, oh gosh, that's a really great question. So for, I guess I'm thinking immediately to just Atlantic salmon fry, um, they survive mostly on macroinvertebrates and macroinvertebrates are definitely affected by water temperature. Um, I wish that was, that's not really my area of expertise, but I do know that colder waters host a much wider variety of macroinvertebrate species. And I also know that macroinvertebrates are, are often one of the best indicators of water quality. Um, and so since any, any species does better when they have a variety of food sources to choose from, um, then I think it's absolutely better for a fish like a salmon um, to have a larger community of macroinvertebrates to feed on. Um, stresses to food sources. I think that's, did that answer your question? Pretty much, okay, good. <laughs> Steve, it looks like you have a question, Steve Brooke. Yes, thank you very much. One of the things that I think is most challenging as we're working on restoration of fisheries like Atlantic salmon is the impact on water temperature of some of the structures that have been put in rivers to create hydropower or hydromechanical power. One of, one of the most interesting pieces of research recently came out of Orono last December. Uh, a graduate student named Sarah Rubenstein published a thesis and has actually calculated the way of uh, Atlantic salmon lose their body fat during their spawning migration. Have you followed Sarah's work and would you comment on it, please? 
Uh, Steve, I wish I could comment on it. Um, I only know about that a little bit peripherally um, through that study. I think DMR would be a much more knowledgeable, knowledgeable source at this time, but I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and I've written down her name as an, as an item. Sarah Rubenstein, you, you can find her thesis at the university, the Folger University, where all the theses are located. Some of the best research in the nation now, the cutting edge research is coming out of Orono. And I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a pretty challenging issue for hydropower operators to deal with. Because when fish are in high temperature waters, they're searching for a tiny hole to get to a fish passage. Uh, they use up an enormous amount of the stored body fat. And oftentimes when they reach their spawning habitat, if they do, they're unable to spawn. And uh, so there are issues like this that are new, just surfacing. And I really look forward to your engagement and involvement here because uh, um, we have major hydropower relicensing underway all across the state. And if in fact, we're ever going to maintain or restore fisheries, we really have to deal with some of the water temperature issues that come up because of large impoundments and uh, discharging, um, on the surface as opposed to deep water. On the surface, the water is warmer, on the, on the on deep water is often cooler. So uh, that's my comment, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Steve. That's also a really great segue into the next question that I see in the chat. Yeah, so Joyce and Reese Anderson, do you wanna ask your question? To unmute you, you. Okay, thank you. I'm new to this. Uh, this is Morris Anderson. I'm a fly fisherman and welcome. So hi, Steve, how are you doing? Uh, my wife and I got into uh, striper fishing and we're following the allies up to the Kennebec and we were down in Damascot. I watched it down here with our grandchild. Uh, I am concerned as Steve mentioned about the minimum flow at the dams. Uh, I used to be at a health inspector and we inspected the whitewater rafting companies up on the Kennebec estuary and there was times when I was up there fly fishing and the minimum flow in the morning would be down to nothing. And of course they wanted to satisfy the whitewater rafters. So they turned the water up in the daytime to satisfy them to, so they could go down the river. And then as Steve mentioned too, the minimum flow, depending on how it's going over the top of the dam you get the surface water versus the water flowing underneath the dam you get in the colder water that's been held back by the deep deep impoundments in back of the dam. Um, have you do, done any water temperatures at those locations, both above and below the, the dam? So a, a little bit. Um, I think water quality is is a lot more important um, than than just water temperature at those impoundments. Um, and I, I think um, a colleague of mine, Emily Zimmerman, has actually done uh, dissolved oxygen monitoring and water quality monitoring up at Temple Stream. Um, and so, yes, in those instances, it's absolutely beneficial, beneficial too, to show the water quality. And um, Emily found, this is again, just very preliminary data, but I mean, the, the, the water at the bottom, um, the the water at the bottom near the impoundment was basically anoxic, which means it had no oxygen, which is what you see in lakes. Um, and, and, you know, up near the surface, dissolved oxygen levels were fairly normal, but you do get that warm water up at the surface. At the surface. And then absolutely, whenever we have a rain event, some of that water will even spill over the dam um, and, and warm temperatures downstream. Um, so yeah, and I, I think that that's, that's absolutely an issue of concern. Um, I have the privilege of not working on large FERC dams, but where even we even see this impact at smaller impoundments. Um, and you can even see it, I think, at some level in, in, in streams where we have remnant dams, where the water is very slow. And you definitely don't have that mixing that we like to see in freshwater streams. Um, and the water slows and it sits there and it mimics a lake much more than a river. Thank so you. in those, um, yeah, water, water quality is um, also very important to monitor. It's just not quite as accessible as um, water temperature monitoring, and it's a little more expensive. I mean, it looks like you had a follow-up question about some of the dams. 
I was just wondering if um, some of these data that you're discussing about water quality and temperature and probably more, um, can that be used to support taking down dams that are no longer functional? Because I, I think I've heard that there's a lot of those, but some people want to hang on to them because they were always there when they were children, you know, that kind of thing. Or does that not apply? Well, I think all those situations are obviously unique, but I think like in in instances where you can get community support for taking out those kinds of dams, then um, if we have water temperature data that shows good cold water upstream and good fish habitat upstream, um, then that kind of information can be a really great, it can provide really great support um, to get grants to help support that removal. Um, and, and it can show some of the value of the fish habitat upstream. But could, so, it be used, could it be used uh, to turn around community decisions that want to keep the dams? Maybe, maybe not. I think it depends. Yeah, I think it. I think it depends on the community. Yeah, um, I think it could be a convincing factor in a community that cares about if it's a sign, um, if fish it's population. Data and if it's really, you know, strong, convincing scientific data against nostalgia, you know, it seems like there ought to be something that could be done. But I know maybe that's a little bit too mean. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I think I think yeah, it's just a, it's such a complicated issue, um, okay. and data where data only weighs so heavily sometimes on those on those instances. Thanks. Yeah, I think we'll be doing um, some monitoring with Kirsten um, this spring, having some volunteers help to monitor monitor water temperature um, at some smelt streams, and we'll mostly be doing them at road crossings. And a piece of that will be kind of thinking about like. Are these, are any of them undersized road crossings where if we were to um, work with the town and help get funding to support improving that size, is there a chance that that could just help that stream flow a little bit faster and help increase that water temperature? And so, so you can do it on the big scale, but I think also at that small scale too. And so um, getting these sensors out there could help the town maybe qualify for grants that they might not be able to qualify for otherwise, or just reach out to, um, to different organizations that could provide further support for some of these. I think there's from US Fish and Wildlife Service, from the Department of Marine Resources, um, and Kelt, we're, we're helping with this too. Um, we've been trying to identify streams that are really important for habitat and then try and figure out um, what we can do to help make them better. And, and we're still, we're learning a lot <laughs> of, and still kind of in the data gathering point. Um, but um, for some of these towns, these might be small crossings and they just don't have the money <laughs> to put in something bigger there. It's too big an effort. Um, and then they might not have the expertise to write grants to get the funds to put it in, even if they knew the money was out there. And so I think that's kind of where we can help be this intermediary of doing some of that fundraising, um, helping to get some of the groundwork done to maybe get some of this through a little bit better. and. Um, help move some projects forward. Definitely. Thank you, Ruth. And that's like, that is a great point. And I, I will say that definitely this data can be used to support um, replacing undersized crossings. Um, and that's something that a lot of people um, are willing to get behind because it's better. It's not only better for the stream, it's generally better for the road and the town too. I think, I mean, some of the remnant dams are, are like that too, especially like as we're getting all of these, like a lot of these really heavy rainstorms. So with more of our rain coming in big gushes, um, the dams just aren't built to deal with huge volumes of water coming through in that sort of way. And so I think some of the really old dams that just aren't serving a purpose anymore can end up being a little more dangerous, but dams are always more complicated. <laughs> there are always more factors to consider than just an underside road crossing. Because when you fix, when you increase the size of a road crossing, the road is safer um, and the fish can get through better. And so it's like a win-win for everybody. But with dams, sometimes there are just more challenges. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Does anyone, um, anyone have anything else they'd like to ask? 
Oh, uh, Maurice, I can, it looks like you're trying to unmute. Um, there we go. All right. Um, you mentioned getting involved with your town with a brook. Let's say we have a brook in our neighborhood that's called Red Brook and it's connected to a Meslonsky stream. It goes underneath a, a highway, Route 23. Do we need the temperature monitors there first before we can do anything or do we do something and then get the temperature monitors there? How do we go about as a neighbor of that brook getting something done so that yep. trout can, can start to come back up that stream as it would, did 20 years ago? Yep. Is it so? Is this crossing undersized? Uh, it's been blocked through. Okay. Because yeah, of the like major culvert. storms, it's been blocked because of beaver dams and, okay. and damaged culvert. Okay. So I think. It would be a lot, I think my first process would be to look at um, the mainstream habitat viewer, which kind of shows, it, it could show the number of barriers to fish passage that are also downstream of this culvert. Um, you can look at habitat upstream of the culvert, um, could even look and see, we can look on the Ecosheds database and see if there's any temperature data in that region um, that could support cold water habitat. Um, that is something that I would, I feel like I'm not really prepared to answer succinctly now, but I could, I'd be happy to follow up with you later if you want more information about that. Um, if, so, Ruth, yeah, if, if, you know, if Ruth just, we just need your, and, your connections and then we'd get, we'll provide you with what, where the place is and what it's yep. called and where it is. And okay, okay. that'd be great. Thank you. We'll be sending out, I think Riley will be sending out an email. Um, Following up with the presentation, it'll have the link to the recording. Um, and Kirsten, do you mind if we share your email address in there? Oh, that'd be, yeah, that's great. Okay, perfect. You didn't tell me it would be on YouTube until the end of time, though. <laughs> <laughs> we can show your grandchildren. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Steve? Yes, Kirsten, uh, if you're a specialist in water quality, does it go so far as to begin to look at the continuing impact of acid precipitation? Uh, I'm concerned about a number of waters where, although the acid precipitation has changed and is not as severe as it was, uh, some of these watersheds are depleted of all of the, the, the basic materials that can uh, support fisheries. We're seeing a lot of areas down east where uh, the fisheries have not recovered at all, despite all of the efforts that have been made for fish passage and other things. And uh, you take a look at the, the, at the pH of the water, um, fish can't survive there. They can't spawn. So I know Maine DEP is now involved in looking at pH and considering it as a, an element of water quality for the state. Uh, is this something else that you may be interested in? Yes, absolutely. Um, and you're absolutely right. That's I, I the same colleague that I mentioned um, earlier, Emily Zimmerman, has been working in down east watersheds um, for the last few years monitoring water quality. Um, it's it's absolutely an issue of concern. Um, water quality gives us a lot more detailed information about the kinds of species that a river can support. Um, if pH measure, if, if we could get some pH sensors that were the same price um, and, and the same durability as water temperature loggers, I would love to put them in the stream together. Um, but I, I think, yeah, absolutely water quality is another thing that we should be looking at because temperature is just one component of that water quality. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a very multifaceted oh. issue. Thank you. Um, we're nearing the end. Does, if, does, it, does anyone have any other questions or are we about ready to wrap up? What are your, not seeing anything in the chat and I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, so I think we'll close for the evening, but thank you all again for coming. Um, 
Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Kirsten, and we'll be sure to share this information out. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Have a great night. Thank you, you too.